It's a cliche, I know, but kids are our future. And it's really important that they get involved with the garden because understanding nature's cycles and secrets is a priceless lesson for their future. Tonight, living proof of the power of biodynamics. It has really improved the health, the soil condition, it's fantastic. An easy backyard transformation. Oh, wow. And how to get your garden in zen balance. And this will bring you good prosperity and more harmonious life. It's a feast for the senses. A smorgasbord of delicious tastes, exquisite sights and exotic smells from Asia and beyond. This is the colourful and vibrant world of Sydney's Cabramatta. Nationalities. Nationalities. Across the board. Everything. you got here, it started off with Yugoslavs, Italians, probably uh, Maltese. Now you've got 130 odd different nationalities. Really? Speak some 70 different languages, some 50 different religions. So, you know, the place has really bloomed and we're proud of every one of our communities that we've got here. Everywhere I look here, I see amazing fresh produce. So it's no wonder the kids at Cabramatta Public School have an inherent interest in exotic produce from all parts of the world. What are these, what are these sticks for? How deep the holes are, that's right. What else have we got? Like a growing number of teachers across the country, Five years ago, Joanne Laxton realised the need for an outdoor educational experience for this culturally diverse community. Would you say that that's a fairly big seed? Initial motivation was to share cultural heritage because this is such a fantastic community and I, I wanted to make sure cultural heritage was kept alive by um, growing produce and, and introducing the kids and the rest of the community to, to each other's produce. What Joanne helped create is an abundant quarter acre block inside the school grounds, featuring fruit, veggies, herbs and native plants inspired by Cabramatta's Asian culture and colour. Walking around with the kids here is just amazing because they really love it. I'm, I'm just being dragged from left to right, up and down. Costa, come and have a look at this. Costa, come and have a look at that. We've got limes, we've got taro, we've got papaya. Come and I'll tell you about our garden. What did you put in? Ah, Tadpoles? Tadpoles? Yeah. yeah. And, and they're on the way now. Where are you guys from? We're we are from, from Samoan. Wow. And how long have you been in Australia? One year. One year? Now, does a tree like this remind you of home? Yeah. What is it? Um, Popo. Yeah. We never buy those at shops, it only grows on trees. They come sometimes to the back of our house and just get it. <laughs> oh, look at all the mandarins. 90% of the students here at Cabramatta Public School are from non-English speaking backgrounds. Oh, so these are your strawberries? Yeah, yeah, there's a few there. Every week, groups from kindergarten to year six spend an hour with Joanne in the garden. Kids in Cabramatta, like kids in, in the wider community in Australia, um, are not getting enough time outdoors. They're spending too much time with electronic equipment. They're, um, you know, sitting on their butts for a little too long and they're missing out on a hell of a lot. And, and, and in our community, um, a lot of the kids live in flats and um, some families are really protective of their kids and they keep them indoors a fair bit. So there's a whole combination of things that mean that our kids don't get out and get their hands dirty very often. We've pulled out the basil and um, we can't use it anymore. Mm. So we... it Smells good, doesn't it? Yeah. Ah. And the dead leaves and other things we'll put into our compost. So you're a bit of a supervisor. Yeah, well, today I am. Here and you guys can start taking the leaves off. Oh, this one here. Yeah. Cut, cut, cut the leaves off here. Yeah. And put them in one bucket. What do you think's eating this one? Caterpillars. Caterpillar insects, yeah. yeah. And also the Ants, yeah. The alocasia 
otherwise known as taro, or for some, elephant's ears, has been a staple throughout Asia and the Pacific for over 5,000 years. It loves a moist soil and it grows to about a metre in six months. What it's grown for is its root, or what they call the corm, the big bulb at the bottom. And that gets baked or boiled. It's a bit like potato. Uh, the leaves itself, they can be used. They wrap things up in them and steam it. Our kids come from families that have been through some really, really sad and traumatic experiences in the past and yet these families are fantastic, they're positive and dynamic and they really, really value our school and what we do for our kids. Now this garden is for me perfect and I was looking around and thinking there's just one little thing missing that would make it complete. Fortunately, it's something that I can help them with. So a little later in the show, I'm going to grab the tools and give them a hand. Last week, we met the Gantos family from Preston in Melbourne and helped them save 25% off their water bill. This week, we're going to show you how to deal with water saving ideas outside the home. And look at this as a great example. It's an absolute desolate wasteland, this front yard. There's work to be done. This compacted soil has meant that when it rains, there is massive runoff, which over time has washed away all of the topsoil, making it near impossible for grass to grow here. Our solution is to lose the grass completely and replace it with a layer of low maintenance mulch. Then we're going to plant a water efficient garden that will be irrigated by a low pressure system fed from the rainwater tank. Good old Catoniasta, classic weed. The birds eat these, pull them out and cover your paths in black spots. Best place for this is in the skip bin. Ah, oh, biscuits. Mm. Nice. No, what do you call them? I call them good. Lebanese is sweet, Lebanese is sweet. Good action. We've dug up all the grass, we're just putting the final touches to the levelling of the soil. I've had some great help here from my little mates and a couple of my big mates too. How you going there guys? Yeah. What we're doing here with my team is we're wetting all the newspapers to cover this whole area so that way it's like a sealer over the top of the soil to hold any weed seed underneath. <laughs> Last week, we installed a rainwater tank and now our plumber has run a pipe from the tank's pump up to a tap in the front yard. Off this tap, we've connected our drip feed irrigation system. It's low pressure, so it brings out just enough water to give our new plantings here exactly what they need. Before we go any further here, we're going to put some nice compost just to prepare this garden bed for the planting. The best part about the compost is that it helps build up the soil and it acts as a sponge. This is another water tank in our garden. It's a nice mix of broken down and composted material and we're mixing that with chicken manure and also cow manure. You just won't get any better than that and this will give our plants a kick start and they'll jump out of the ground like you wouldn't believe. For Norma's garden, We've chosen plants that are hardy and require little maintenance. This is called a Dianella goddess, beautiful emerald green plant. It's a native, doesn't require too much water, and it's going to grow to about 1.2 metres high, which will create a nice little fence for Norma's front yard. When you take it out, give the roots a little bit of a tease, water your hole, and then backfill it with a mixture of compost and existing soil. Like the Dianella, we've gone with the Leptospermum because it's a native. This variety is called Starry Night. It's got a beautiful purple new growth. It grows up to about the two metre height and it's going to provide a perfect screen for Norma's front yard here. We've gone with another Callistamon on the side boundary here to match up with the two existing ones and that'll grow up and create a nice screen. The variety is the Mary MacKillop 
and it's got great flowers which will attract lots of birds. They don't need too much water and they need very little maintenance. Well there you have it Norma. The grass is gone, this doesn't require any work. There's irrigation under there, you've just got to come and turn it on. Thank you Costa. Pleasure Norma. It looks beautiful, that's what I wanted. I have no time to water it so it, it's very nice. Thank you very much. Well, just when you think that the day's over, it comes to light that there's one more very important task that needs attention. It's actually Norma's birthday today. Happy birthday, Norma. Hooray! 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 Happy birthday, Norma. <laughs> what a surprise! Oh yeah, look at that. That's gonna get big. Welcome back to Costa's Garden Odyssey. Today we're exploring this fantastic gardening program at Cabramatta Public School. Yeah. What enthuses me the most is that the kids are working as a team, collaboratively making decisions and solving problems, as well as getting a great understanding of how to grow their own fresh produce. But to me, it isn't a fully functioning garden unless it's got a perfect water supply. Around the back of the classroom here is this 10,000 litre tank. Unfortunately, the pump burnt out some time ago. So what I'm gonna do is replace the submersible pump and then install a digital timer so that the gardens can water themselves during the holidays. Once I've installed the submersible pump, I'll be able to connect the tank to the existing irrigation system and it will all be run from inside the classroom. These digital timers are great because basically they're your gardener that's here when no one else is here, particularly during the holidays. What you can do with these is set the days you want it to come on, the time you want it to come on and how long you want it to water for. That way the water in our tank is precisely controlled and distributed through our drip irrigation exactly where we want it. They're simple, but they do a great job. Now, the moment gardening coordinator Joanne has been waiting for. Right, here we go. Yay! There it is. Yay, we have that water. That is rain tank water. Yeah, fantastic. That's what I want to see. Thank you so yeah. much. We oh, appreciate it. Look, and the kids, will, the kids will love it. And they'll really love learning about how it works too. This may look like a disused mine site, but we're actually 800 metres above sea level in the midwestern New South Wales town of Ryleston. And this dam is the centrepiece of Lakeland's olive farm, one of the most innovative biodynamic and organic olive operations in Australia. Let's face it, the olive originated in the Mediterranean, but 13 years ago, one man decided to grow an olive tree in a place they said it could not be done. Oh, I love uh, Australia, I love the place here. This was a rundown uh, part of the property. There was not a tree, there was no grass, there was just dirt. Where well, I decided to plant olive trees and uh, I'm very happy I did that. Now, the property boasts some 4,000 trees and has put this area on the olive growing map. Knut managed this feat thanks to biodynamics, a farming practice that focuses on building nutritious soil. About seven years ago you went biodynamic. What has that meant to the farm and the operation? It has really improved the health of the grove. If you look around, you see the grass cover, the richness of the grass, the clover, uh, the soil condition, it's fantastic. The secret to Knut's great soil are the biodynamic mixtures he makes, which are called preparations. These preparations are made from manure and other waste, using processes that mimic nature. So Knut, what exactly is this structure doing with the water? Because uh, this is our flow form in which we activate the water, energise it, swirl the water in a vortex. A bit like a creek. Yeah, sort like of natural thing. creek flowing, sort of. The water is energised. Canut adds some biodynamic manure, which gets dissolved by the swirling water 
and makes a rich, nutritious tonic for the soil. This is then gently sprinkled into the groves once a season and helps the farm find its natural balance of microorganisms. Now I'm picking away at these olives. How do I know that they're actually ready to pick? Yes, uh, we are cool climate here, so our olives do not turn in colour like you would expect at uh, lower altitudes. So what I've learned over the years is to test for the squeezability of the fruit and see how much uh, oil water is in there. So I do this here, I oh. squeeze, yeah, that's okay. That's, it's beautiful, <laughs> yeah. beautiful juice, Costa. And you see, if there is only water, then this will disappear now. You feel that in your hands, this is beautiful oil. <laughs> in Knut's processing shed, the olives are sorted, washed and crushed into a paste. This paste is kneaded by a malaxa to release the olive juices. These flow into the centrifuge, which separates out the water, leaving the precious olive oil. Has using biodynamic principles connected you to the environment? Oh, definitely, Costa. I've learned to look into more details in the land, uh, take a holistic approach to the energies around us, the cycles, and uh, apply them. And then, uh, in our holistic approach, uh, make this growth sustainable. Whether you buy your home in a new estate such as this, or in an older, more established suburb, one thing's for sure, all gardens have their little problem corners. This week on Pimp My Plants, a call for help from Lisa and Nev King. They've got a classic problem area in their backyard, the south facing fence line. We're gonna show them how they can fix it. Ah, so this is the problem area. Yeah, it kind of isn't what we want. It's um, a little bit of an eyesore at the moment, as you can see. All right, so that's north? Yeah, that's north, that's south. So it gets quite a bit of shade. And then on top of that, we're dealing with a whole clay issue that we're not quite sure what to do with. The trouble with a garden that faces away from the sun and a soil that is rock hard because of clay is that it makes it a real struggle for plants to grow. Well, we want to do something whereby we can sit and watch our son play in the yard. Oh, OK, so you want it a little bit separate, but... Yeah, a little adult supervision area. Mm. OK. <sighs> Heavy barrow. <laughs> I can't do all this on my own, so I've roped in Nev and his mate Brenham. You right? Absolutely. You ready for action? Yep. We'll grab hold of these pots. We've got to get them moving. Oh, yeah. oh, they're ingrown yeah. pots. Yeah. Look at these muscles. What I'm going to do today is lay a small area of paving surrounded by border plants so that Lisa and Nev can sit in comfort and watch little Declan play. Hey Nev, you've got some serious pets in the backyard here. Oh wow. Look at these guys, they're big. Which is great. Yep. They're going to help break down the clay. Yep. Lots of nice castings for the plants to grow. Awesome. And uh, we'll mix some sand in there as well. Okay. To help break it down quicker. To give the illusion of space and to bring more light into the area, I'm installing this trompe de l'oeil. It's going to go here, but to get it in place, we have to cut this lily pilly back so that it's right on our central axis. It'll play with people's minds because the perspective will lead you off into the wild blue yonder. Nev and Brenham are just adding soil conditioner to the soil that I've dug out, which is quite clay. We're going to mix that up and that will backfill around our buxus. I've chosen Buxus microphylla Faulkner. This is actually a smaller growing version. This one only grows to about half a metre, which is what Lisa wants. Just a little hedge so that she can watch the little fella playing. We've lined up our xylosmas. They're gonna grow up and cover the fence. There'll be a beautiful backdrop of green. We're gonna mix our soil conditioner and then plant them out. Okay. Adding soil conditioner and a good dose of gypsum will help break up the clay, preventing water from pooling and killing these new plants. Beautiful. <laughs> gypsum, it's always good to sing when you apply gypsum. We've put our bedding sand in and compacted it, and now the first pave has gone down. 
It's the most critical one because everything is lined up off that. After all the pavers have been laid out, I'll secure them with a concrete edge and then mulch with a fine pine bark. And now, my moment of truth. What do you reckon? Oh, wow. I cannot believe it's the same space. Oh, it's just brilliant. It's kind of low maintenance as yeah. well. Yeah, yeah. Now that's brilliant. Thank you so much. I cannot believe it's the same spot. Feng Shui, meaning wind and water, is the ancient Chinese art that focuses on energy. It states that Mother Earth possesses a powerful life force that when combined with nature's elements can determine whether we lead happy, successful and prosperous lives. Feng Shui is an ancient Chinese art. It's all about to get the qi flow correctly. Having a, a good garden can bring your very positive qi and can enhance your, your life in a positive way. To build a harmonious garden, we need to balance the five elements. They are earth, water, wood, fire and metal. The earth element relate to the mountain. You know, we can use man-made mountain or a natural hill. Water relate to what actual water, the fish pond, water feature, a creek. Wood element refer to the trees, flowers, pot plants. And some metal objects relate to metal elements, round poles, or actual metal decorations. And lighting relate to the fire elements. Through balancing these elements, we can have a good garden. And this will bring you a good health, good prosperity, a more harmonious life. The fantastic thing about the Cabramatta Public School Garden is that not only do the kids learn about and cultivate all this fresh produce, but they get to take it back into the classroom and cook it, and better still, To me, that's as good as it gets. So the ingredients, we use the, everything from our garden. Oh. They get to see nature at work. They understand where their food comes from because they've planted the seeds and they've planted the plants that actually uh, produce the food that they're eating. <laughs> this really has been an inspiring day to see the kids learning so much in the garden and in the kitchen. And what's more, they're taking this knowledge home with them. We get to cook the food and eat it. It tastes nice. Shua has three children that have benefited greatly from the outdoor class. They understand what they're eating as well, not just eating what's on their plate. It's just amazing what the kids are getting out of this gardening project. I'm so happy. And I'm also pretty happy because tonight the Dima family has invited me over to taste the fruits of their labour. Shua, thanks for inviting us back after a big day in the garden. No, no Hospitality's been great. My pleasure. Kids, thanks for showing around the school garden today. It was just fantastic. Cabramatta Public School Garden rocks, if you ask me. I loved it. Food's been great. Hope you enjoyed it like I did. We'll see you next week. <laughs> Next week, I put my body on the line to find a water solution for a common problem. We're taking the major water issues and turning them into the design resolution. When water tanks go bad. Oh. 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 
and the crucial role of the worker bee. If we lost our bee pollinators, the human race wouldn't survive more than a few years.